Come in. The key is in the door. Mrs. Brinks? Derek's formal wear. I, I brought the dress. Just a moment. I brought along a size 11 also. Just in case it didn't fit, they run a little small. A scene from Old Boyfriends with John Belushi encountering Talia Shire. He's one of the old boyfriends she visits on a cross-country trip to rediscover her past. Old Boyfriends is just one of five new films we'll be reviewing on Sneak Previews, two film critics discussing the latest movies. And this is Roger Ebert, the film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Across the aisle for me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. In addition to Old Boyfriends, we'll be reviewing Hurricane, the multi-million dollar South Seas epic, Picnic at Hanging Rock, which is about a mysterious disappearance of a group of schoolgirls in Australia, and Dreamer, the story of a kid from Southern Illinois who bowls his way into the championships. You could call him the Rocky of the bowling alleys. But first, Gene starts with The Bell Jar. Roger, The Bell Jar is a novel written by poet Sylvia Plath, who committed suicide at age 31 back in 1963. The novel is a semi-autobiographical book about two years of psychic pain experienced by the writer's alter ego, Esther Greenwood, a college student in the 50s. Marilyn Hassett, who starred on the other side of the mountain, plays Esther Greenwood. She's a very confused college student, as she tells her boyfriend one night. Remember the night we drove back from the Harvard game? And you asked me if I wanted to live in the city or in the country. And I said both. But I wanted to live in both places at once. And you laughed. And you said that anybody that felt like that had to be a true neurotic. Well, you're right. And I'll always be torn between two things like living in the country or the city. Being a poet or a housewife. I know that. I'm neurotic as hell. And it fragments me and scatters me all over the place. And I'll probably end up spending the rest of my life flying back and forth between one mutually exclusive thing and another. why he can't fly with her. It's a sad scene, maybe, but it doesn't make much sense at all. She's just mouthing words there when she tells her boyfriend about wanting to be both a poet and a housewife. We don't buy it. Up until this point in the movie, all she's ever talked about is wanting to be a poet. In fact, to help her writing career, after graduation, she wins a chance to work as an editorial assistant on a New York women's magazine. Now the movie gets really loony as Esther talks with one of her Southern Belle girlfriends, who also works at the magazine, about their writing careers. Do you really want to be in fashion? Oh, Lordy, no. I want to write novels of unending passion and unrequited love, like Philomena Guinea writes. Philomena Guinea? Yeah. She's my sponsor at school. You know her? You mean you really know her? Tell me what she's like. Well, she's very tall and uh -huh. very austere, and she talks very English, although she was born in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but she writes pop boilers, Zoreen. So what? She makes loads of money. You know, they make movies out of her books. She travels all over the world. But that's just a dream. I mean, I'm going to wind up mad with a bunch of kids, and that's as far as my old pipe dream's going to go anyway. It's not a pipe dream. You can do anything you want to. Oh. You really could. You could be a scientist, a doctor. You could be a lady of the crew champions, or a Boston Symphony trumpet player, or a deep sea diver. Or you could be a pot boiler writer, or a pot writer boiler, or a writer boiler pot. You are, you are behind the barn. <laughs> Unbelievable. A classic <laughs> dumb moment in the movies. That scene's a cross between All My Children and Hee Haw. <laughs> Seen as a look of a low-grade soap opera, as does the entire second half of the film, as Esther encounters an assortment of slobbering men who want to rape her. 
The film, The Bell Jar, really trashes the novel, and that's a particular shame. Sylvia Plath, the author, has a wide following among young women in college. They read her poetry, and they don't regard her novel or her poetry as soap opera. They identify with its revelations and relate to its psychic pain. I think those readers will be insulted and angered by what's happened to The Bell Jar. As for those who haven't read the book, they'll just find the movie boring and I think sometimes laughable. I agree. You know, one of the problems that the movie faces and never solves is the problem of making a writer interesting in the first place in a movie. Writing is not a cinematic act. I mean, ordinarily you see the guy, it's the middle of the night, he's tearing paper out of the typewriter, throwing it across the room, drinking scotch. She doesn't even go that far. She writes a couple of notes in a loose leaf binder and that's it. Yeah, it doesn't show the madness either very creatively. All that she does throughout the film pretty much is scream at the top of her lungs. And when you start at an emotional pitch that high fairly early in the movie, the actress has no place to go. That's unrelenting. And there's another problem, too. She's always going on and on about how this woman's magazine in New York is beneath her. Mm -hmm. And yet the entire movie is on the level of true romances or true confessions. This mm -hmm. is one of the few movies about suicide in which the audience is shouting, jump, jump, you know, <laughs> get it over with. You're right. Put us out of our misery. You're right. <laughs> Next, we have a mysteriously beautiful and haunting film called Picnic at Hanging Rock. One sunny summer day nearly 70 years ago, or so an old story goes, a party of Australian schoolgirls went on a picnic to Hanging Rock, an ancient outcropping at the edge of the sea. Now, some of them never returned. And strangely enough, when I tell you that, I'm not revealing the ending. Here's a scene from early in the film, and watch how the director, Peter Weir, uses music and sunlight and easy laziness to establish a mood in which danger lurks just out of sight. <laughs> Uh, you wouldn't have the time, I suppose, miss. Ah, Miranda, you pretty little diamond watch. Don't wear it anymore. Can't stand it ticking above my heart. Ah. <laughs> if it were mine, I'd wear it always. Even in the bar. <laughs> what do you, Mr. Hussey? Stopped at 12. Never stopped before. Must be something magnetic. Well after two, I'd say. We'd better be careful. Uh, I promised Mrs. Appleyard I'd have you a lot back at the college by eight. Except for those people down there, we might be the only living creatures in the whole world. Clothes and manners there are really in Congress in that savage landscape, which is one of the ways that the movie makes its point. Now, the girls wander off to explore Hanging Rock, and then the rest is silence. And, but there's one girl who eventually does reappear, and she doesn't remember what happened, or she says she doesn't. And after she recovers, she returns to the school and to intense and hostile curiosity. It's as if they blame her for what happened. See who we have with us today. Our dear Irma is with us but for a few hours. She is leaving soon to join her parents in Europe. Alors, mes enfants, for ten minutes you may talk as you choose. If you approve, Miss Lamley.
They're really attacking their own secret fears. They don't know what happened up on Hanging Rock, but they have some very disturbing suspicions. And Picnic at Hanging Rock obviously isn't a conventional thriller. There's no violence. There are no big scenes of the girls in danger. But the movie is uncanny in the way it suggests that the most unspeakable terrors lurk just around the next turn. The whole movie is filled with an unexplained supernatural menace. It's an unusual film. It's an odd film. And in its approach to the thriller, it's almost disturbingly original. I really got caught up in it, and I liked it. What do you mean it's disturbingly original in its approach to the thriller? Well, I think, well, a good question, I suppose. The thriller ordinarily has a denouement. Something happens at the end to explain everything. Mm -hmm. The most disturbing thing about this film is that this catastrophe takes place, the girls disappear, and nothing is explained. They just go into the void and they're gone. And that's the very point where I disagree with you about this picture. I admire its skill. It is a beautiful film. It's an intriguing subject. I'm really wondering what happened. And yet we don't get that payoff, and that frustrated me. I felt for about an hour that we get little clues, something might happen, nothing's delivered. I, that's what I love, the fact that you think something's going to happen and nothing does. These are people who are down in a landscape where they don't belong. They're kind of civilized uh, British immigrants, let's mm -hmm. say, or the children of immigrants. They're in this savage, ancient landscape. They don't belong there. They disappear. If there were an explanation, they fell into the river or the sea and drowned. They were mm -hmm. bitten to death by flies. Mm -hmm. Anything like that would be disappointing. Well, the question is even better when it's not answered. Yeah, but I don't think so. The, 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 one, the answers that you give, I think, are rather trivial, and you, you probably aren't serious about them. They're certainly trivial compared to the rest of the film. Okay. We expect something okay. significant. For me, it's like if you get a beautifully, expensively wrapped gift, and you're all intrigued by the paper, the ha first hour of the picture, let's say, you open it up, there's nothing there. That's frustrating. I can't think of anything I would rather have inside that gift than the, the great silence and the great feeling of mystery that this film leaves. I don't want anything to be there. I like the way the, the film ends. Okay, well, I will say this about the film. I think of all the five pictures that we have on the show, this is the best one. Okay. And now to change the subject completely, I don't know if you know this, but you happen to be sitting uh, across the aisle from a guy who likes to go bowling. I, that really is changing the subject, right. as a matter Well, the only reason I mention that is to say that uh, as a 165 average bowler, which is nothing special, I was really looking forward to our next film, Dreamer, which turns out to be yet another adaptation of the Rocky story. This time it's a rag-to-riches bowler who wants to become a national champion, both for himself and his old-timer coach. Tim Matheson from the movie Animal House is the bowler. Here he is at his first major tournament. <laughs> Even as a bowler, I've got to admit that it isn't very exciting watching a guy knock down all the pins when you just know he's going to knock down all the pins. Maybe that's why they added that music there and to spike up the action. Anyway, he brings his trophy that he wins back to his home base, a small town bowling alley, where he's got to fix a broken pin setting machine before encountering his girlfriend, played by Susan Blakely. Hi there, sugar. I got something for you. Oh, yeah? How come you didn't come by and show me a new car? Karen Lee, don't start that way, okay? You don't get it, do you, Dreamer? It's the principle of the thing that I'm talking about. That you're first? Yeah, right. Instead of bowling, Harry and bowling. This is for you. Thank you. Well, you did it, huh? Uh huh. You like that? It's nice. It's real pretty. And so are you. And I missed you. I missed you, too. I love you. How much? What does that mean? It means I want to go with you next time. The time I took you, I bowled 146 and finished out of the money right in the hole. hole. That's right. Oh, we had fun, remember? Oh, you had fun. I didn't like losing. Yeah, neither did Harry, right? 
What are we arguing about? I'm back. I won, okay? No more arguing? Okay. Please? Okay. No more arguing. I'll just go with you next time, that's all. No, you won't. And if you don't want that, just leave it. Oh, I want it. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. It's mine. You gave it to me. Movie makers really lay it on thick when they give us <laughs> characters from small towns, you know. Watching Hollywood films, you'd think everyone from the South or a small town had a lobotomy at birth. <laughs> anyway, the story gets cornier and cornier, and worse, the twists of the plot are thoroughly predictable, all coming down to, of course, one last game, which is far less interesting than any of the bowling tournaments you see every week on TV. Now, there are reportedly 20 million regular bowlers in this country. Well, we were waiting for a good story about bowling, but Dreamer, which does have a couple of pleasant performances in it, Dreamer really isn't it. Well, I'm not a bowler. I was not <laughs> waiting for a good story about bowling, and I was certainly not waiting for this story. Yeah. You mentioned Rocky. Rocky was a good movie. It had mm. a lot of cliches that it used very well, with a lot of energy. Yeah, we were seeing them for the first time in a long time. In a long time, yeah. yeah. Now we see them on, on the average of every week. This movie is so predictable. You sit there and you say, now he's going to do this, now that. Here comes the big match. Here's his <laughs> girlfriend. Here's his coach. Will the coach have a heart attack? Will he win the big match? Will he make up with his girlfriend? It's so predictable, it's depressing. Yeah, and um, I really thought that as I was watching there, I see these nice, pleasant performers in there, and why are they trapped in this kind of picture? Yeah, it's a pleasant movie. It's not an ordeal to sit through, except for the story, which is <laughs> absolutely, you know, predictable. Right. Here's one I liked a lot better. It's called Old Boyfriends, and right at the beginning of Old Boyfriends, Talia Shire reads to us from her diary. Her life hasn't turned out to her satisfaction, she's discovered, and so she's decided to go on a trip and revisit three of her old boyfriends. She thinks that if she can find out where she went wrong with them or where they went wrong with her, she can figure out how to repair her own life. Well, one of the boyfriends is John Belushi, last seen in Animal House. Now he's running a tuxedo rental company in Denver. She dresses in red because she'd like him to think he's about to be seduced. Thanks very much. Hey, you're Diane Cruz. Diane Cruz from Central High. Don't you remember me? Eric Katz. Eric, oh, Eric, my God. Oh, my God, of course. I, I didn't expect it. Oh, Eric, look, we got to talk, but let me take these. Oh, yeah. i got to try these on. Oh, yeah. oh no. there's a bottle of scotch over there that they sent me. You open it, pour yourself a drink, and I'll be right back. boys are playing a lot of high school proms, you know? You remember my band, don't you? We used to wear those red shirts, the blue dickies, and we used to wear the blue shirts. You could see the dickie right through. But anyway, I realized I could, I could make some money in clothes. You know, the kids have to rent tuxes and formals to proms, so why not rent them from me? Eric Katz, the guy who plays the proms. <laughs> You could almost read Belushi's mind. He's out on delivery. He finds Talia Shire in an egligé. Boy, is he lucky, but boy, is he in for an unpleasant surprise. If that scene didn't seem quite realistic, there's a reason for that. The director of Old Boyfriends, Joan Tewksbury, doesn't intend for us to see the story on a literal level. She sees it more as a fairy tale in which the young princess goes off to visit three Prince Charmings, <laughs> and the first character is sort of heroic. The second is Belushi, who we just saw. And then she meets Keith Carradine, who is the brother of her old boyfriend, Louis, who was killed in Vietnam. Carradine is a special case. I had uh, quite a crush on Lewis. I guess everybody did. They made a big deal out of it when they brought his body back. They had a parade and made speeches. What do you do? Did you join the service too? No. I was exempted by the sole surviving son provision. What do you do now? Odd uh, jobs. I help out at the store sometimes. Where do you live? Here. I'm the sole surviving son. Oh. <laughs> Louis let me visit him at the camp once. Everybody went, but I was the one he wanted to see. Were you his favorite? Sure, he was mine. He was mine, too. Louis was going to be a writer. Sometimes I write stories. Maybe you could write a story about it. 
Maybe I could write a story about you. Maybe. Maybe we could be friends. You can kind of glimpse strange things there in Carradine's mind. Old Boyfriends is an ambitious movie that wants to say a lot of things about love and memory and madness and about the real nature of relationships between men and women. But it doesn't always succeed, maybe because it tries to do too many things for one movie. There are sad scenes and violent ones and others that are played simply for laughs, and the movie never quite comes together. But it is original, and it's interesting, and it has some fine moments. I'd take a chance on it. I wanted to take a chance on it, especially when she says she's going to go back and revisit her past. But we find out that isn't what she's really up to. It's such a depressing, downbeat character. I really didn't care about her journey. I think the movie is about the fact that what she says she's going to do at the beginning is not what she's really going to do. The revelation of her real motives are part of the film. Well, if it had been a stronger film up until then, then the revelation would have made some sense. But since we don't get it in the beginning, I was thoroughly confused. Really. Well, I don't think it's a great film, but I did think it was very much worth seeing. Well, one thing, it's a lot better than our next picture, that's for sure. I haven't really <laughs> liked any of the movies on this show, and so to keep my record solidly intact, let's get to Hurricane, which <laughs> has a lock on becoming one of the worst films in 1979. Or of the decade. I think I'm with you. <laughs> First of all, they couldn't even get the title right. Hurricanes in the South Pacific, where this film takes place, are called typhoons. <laughs> this is another story of a skittish white woman falling in love with a dark-skinned native prince. You know the story very well. The romance gets the native god so angry that that brings about the typhoon is... Mia Farrow and her island prince scramble for safety by shinning up a tree. <laughs> Hurricane is supposedly an expensive movie, but in this scene that you're about to see, I think you're going to be able to spot the cheap miniature island <laughs> village, and then when the actors are being filmed in a special effects pool. Also, watch for the cliché at the very end of the scene as the typhoon hits. <laughs> Brother, <laughs> that says it all about the unoriginality of this picture. The movie runs nearly two hours, a dull 90-minute romance followed by a 30-minute rainstorm. Just awful. You wonder sometimes what good actors are doing in a movie like this. You think of Jason Robards, Academy Award winner. Max von Sydow, he's been in a dozen pictures by Bergman. Trevor Howard, 40 years of great British <laughs> filmmaking. Apparently, they just couldn't pass up the opportunity for a big paycheck and spend the summer on Bora Bora. The movie is a complete mess. Yeah, there's really nothing more to be said about it. Awful. One to absolutely miss. There is one more thing to be said about it. Please miss it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now here's Spot, the Wonder Dog, to remind us it's time for Dogs of the Week, where each of us picks the week's worst movies. Right, Gene, and my dog this week is Beyond the Door, number two, that is. The original Beyond the Door was an Italian ripoff of The Exorcist, badly dubbed into English. But Beyond the Door, number two, breaks new ground. It's an Italian <laughs> ripoff of The Omen, part two, badly dubbed into English. <laughs> Let's see, it's about a little boy with strange satanic powers, and about his mother who possesses deep and dark secrets, and about how they live in a house with creaking doors and strange noises <laughs> and mysterious cold basement walls and razor blades that fly through the air, and worst of all, a disembodied hand that's always clutching <laughs> at the hapless mother. And if that's not bad enough, this kid amuses himself by jumping out from behind doors and scaring people. What a sense of humor, right? My advice is forget about what's behind the door, part one or part two, and send this little monster to summer camp permanently. Sounds like a very good idea. My <laughs> dog has a basis in martial arts. It's Circle of Iron, with David Carradine of Kung Fu TV fame serving again as a great wise master, trying to teach an anxious young student. The student is thrown out of school by a mean teacher for roughhousing, then he meets Carradine. Carradine plays many roles in order to challenge his young student, but his disguises are laughable, <laughs> not frightening. Carradine is a weird dude who captures flies with his bare hands, <laughs> a skill he says that is not designed to impress others. I can see why. 
That skill puts him on a par with a no-press strip from Shell, you know. <laughs> Actually, the whole movie is stuck at that level. Okay, Gene, two great dogs of the week. And speaking of dogs, are you listening, Spot? Here's a present for you from a woman in Dallas, Texas, who says that you're her favorite on the program. She sent this to you, right? Yes, very thankful. Well, uh, very kind of her. Oh, look at this. It's a squeeze toy in the form of a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> you're a pretty <laughs> tough critic, aren't you, Spot? <laughs> okay, now let's take another look at the movies on this week's program. The Bell Jar, rated, raw, rated R, starred Marilyn Hassett as a suicidal young poet in a story that made soap operas look good. Neither Gene nor I can even remotely recommend you see it, so two no's for that one. Hurricane is one of the most expensive and one of the most ridiculous epics of recent <laughs> years. It's an ill wind that blows no good. This one certainly doesn't. We give it two no's as well. <laughs> Picnic at Hanging Rock was the beautiful, mysterious, low-key thriller from Australia. We both liked its mood of impending danger, but Gene was disappointed by its ending. I also found good things in Old Boyfriends. It doesn't succeed completely, but I think it's worth seeing. Gene didn't believe in its lead character. And we both say no to The Dreamer, the all-too-familiar saga of a plucky bowler striking <laughs> his way to the top. And Gene, that's five negative votes for you. That must be some kind of a record. Well, I don't make the movies. I just review them. <laughs> but, you know, I did like the squeeze toy. <laughs> so much for this program. Next on Sneak Previews, we'll show you scenes from the new Woody Allen comedy, Manhattan. Also, Sir Lawrence Olivier and A Little Romance, and Dawn of the Dead, the violent and controversial new horror film made by the director who made the classic Night of the Living Dead. Until then, see you at the movies. Funding for this program is provided by this station and by other public television stations.